Enter. Enter. New contender. At these dark nostrils you inhale fragrances from underground. Novelties the airs will carry. Ancestors mighty force. Smoothness emanates from grottoes. The wailing of the putrefied. Flashing beeping death exhilaration. Here we commemorate the somber. Those that will outlast. Messages upturned. In new spirits. The polymer. Will fold. The paradise. The smooth. Evans short song. The higher gone below. Shining lights in tunnels. The meowing. Of the cats. Radiating. Decaying proof. Neil. You knew me last. The wasteful one. The greatest. Has retracted. In dust gone pale. Escape the blazes. In empires of new debris. Even in the highest strata. Trickle down on us. Newly fake. Snow of fallus tiring. Charming gent. The engine's desire to remain. Faithful to petrol's warmth. You are the new propellant. The new carbonate. Life shall persevere beyond you embellishment of splendor enter humility in this dark temple diamonds they skull adorn you the part of the new layer rock hard survival on the pillars of your fall okay, so what you're just smelling is plastic fumes and as you know they're damaging to the brain and therefore also cause a slight intoxication and this is what my project I will present you here with is about. It's called Toxic Temple. Um, and in it, I'm trying to combine in thinking and in practice a multimedia art pra practice I'm doing with my colleague and friend Anna Lerchbaumer, who cannot be here for private reasons. Uh, we're trying to think together about religion and pollution or intoxication and spirituality. So we try to think together is there some kind of religiosity, some kind of spirituality in our fucking up the planet, to say it a bit bluntly here. Um, and I will give you a little bit of insights what this is about. What you've just heard is one of 13 prayers I wrote, poem-like prayers, which uh, always have a subject of like addressing the afterlife, the plastic waste, the nuclear waste. And I'm trying to communicate with what could be after humanity because we will leave a lot of waste behind. And I'm trying to think through this um, with Anna Lerchbaum. I always have to insist that this is a project we're doing together, and for personal reasons she cannot be here. Um, and I will present you a little bit what this is about. Um, so um, maybe another alert I, I have to give here. I'm coming from Europe, and I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm deeply embedded in a Eurocentric perspective. I'm trying to lose it up. But if I sometimes use a we, maybe in a <laughs> sentence, be alert that this might be European we and not so much an Indian we and I'm very interested in a dialogue how you see this project and I will try to say a little bit about Shiva later on and would be very interested in your takes on it actually. Um, so why toxic temple? Why think about religion and pollution? What could that be? Um, if we look um, into the history of religions there's actually a lot of intoxication in all the religions. So in Christianity, there is this important role for wine. Um, in the Sufi Islam and other forms of Islam, we have hashish and marijuana, which plays a, a, a big ro role. In Amerindian religions, we have ayahuasca or, or peyote cactuses, which are used for religious practices. So there's a lot of intoxication happening, <coughs> happening in, in other religions. Um, and on the other side, there's also a lot about cleanliness, cleansiness in religions. So we know it from, from what is called today Hinduism, that there's a the caste system, that there are clean castes and not so clean castes. They're considered to be like that. So cleanliness and intoxication, waste, dirt always play a big role in religions, but more on a moral base when we talk about dirt, about sexuality, but not so much about pollution. Uh, I would say this is because we are only slowly um, developing a global consciousness of our environmental status, which is precarious. Um, and so I would say now there is a time that we might also think, uh, need, find a, a, a need to think about a, a global death drive or a global need to destroy and to affirm this. Um, but so far I would say in our cultures, when we, when we, when we see it, that the unclean has always been pushed aside. So we've always tried to not think about what we considered dirty in our cultures, be that 
our waste, I'm talking of shit and piss here, or be it um, um, our sexuality, which is also in many religions considered to be dirty. And so this is always pushed, pushed aside. Uh, a French philosopher, she's called Julia uh, Kasteva, calls this the abject. She's a philosopher and a psychoanalyst. And her argument is basically that we have to cultivate what we've repressed so far to the abject, to get a little further and also to develop forms of relating with each other which are less toxic. And I would like to try to think about this also uh, about our environmental status or our toxic relation to the planet. Um, and I think that religion in this matter, and please don't get me wrong, this is a speculation which, is, which also requires a lot of humor in it, um, that religion can help us there because if we look at the etymology, so where the word religion comes from, uh, it's not completely settled, but one of the, 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 the most believed uh, origins is religio, religio from Latin, and this means reconnect. So we can, through religion, reconnect what has been separated in our society so far. And so I'm trying to affirm our waste, our, our, our need to, 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 to pollute the planet through this, this form of religion. Um, and maybe ask the question, are we maybe having a cosmic death drive? Do we maybe, is there maybe a hidden desire to destroy this planet? Because we're obviously doing it, Why, what, what is behind it? And I, I would like to get the, beyond this question um, on, on the angle of religion. And for this personally, um, the philosophy of another French philosopher, I'm very French influenced here, I'm sorry about that, uh, helped me a lot, which is Georges Bataille. He's a writer and philosopher um, who has written between the 30s and the 60s. Um, and his um, maybe most well-known philosophical work is called The Accursed Chair. And this is basically a philosophy of waste. And this is quite unique because, there, at least in Western philosophy, there are not many philosophies of waste. Um, and, and his theory is very interesting and can be applied to ecological theory as well, would be my argument. Um, so I'm just giving you a quick run through, uh, through Bataille's argument. Um, according to Bataille, um, every living organism receives a lot of energy, mainly from the sun. It's actually an excess of energy, it's too much energy. So every organism basically consists of two movements. One is like gaining the energy, but the other one is also like dispensing the energy again, like wasting it again, like letting energy out again. And these outlets are of course death, the, the most classic one, it's sexuality, and it's again our excrements. Um, and he's saying um, that in, in various uh, older cultural practices, there were actually rituals which, which served this function of also dispensing energy. He's talking about sacrifices there, he's talking about feasts, about carnivals, also about the potlach, which is a very inter interesting uh, ritual in Amerindian uh, um, um, cultures in, in, the, in the Americas. Um, so there have always been ways of dispensing energy for cultures. Um, but Bataille's argument is that we've lost this um, cultural place for waste in Christian and then what became capitalist society. Because his argument is, and I think we can go with that, that capitalism uh, was created out of a Christian culture, culture in Western Europe, and then globalized the world, and we now all live under this capitalist condition. And this capitalism emerged, <coughs> this is Bataille's argument, out of repressing this need to dispense and to waste. So everything is only focused on growth. And I, I'm sure you know this from economics, for example. Economics only talk about economic growth, and we never really think about where, where is actually this growth going, going to, what is happening after that. And also about, I mean, if you look at the, at the signboards here everywhere, they all talk about your personal growth, your personal getting bigger and getting somewhere. But I mean, in the end, we're all dying. <laughs> and we also need to sleep. We also need rest phases. So we, we also need to think about this part. Um, but since Bataille is saying that in capitalist society we are repressing this, this need to waste, this need to dispense energy, this is being let out in horrible ways because it needs to get out. And Bataille's argument, and we need to mind that he wrote in 1949, so four years after the Second World War, which was the most destructive war so far. So Bataille's argument is that this excess of energy, if we don't control it in a societal way, gets out in horrible bloody wars. So if we don't find ways to, to cultivate our need to waste, it would be a horrible war. Um, my argument or my interpretation of Bataille for today would be that if we, if we read this ecologically, 
maybe it's not only wars today where, where this uh, this capitalist repression of excess energy is, is being let out, um, but it's also the ecological damages we are seeing around campus everywhere. <laughs> um, so I would say if we don't uh, find uh, um, means to, to love our waste, to, to see how dispensing energy is needed, um, uh, it might just come out uncontrollably and destroy the planet and us, and us is now humanity and many other earthly critters on this planet with it. Uh, like that. So this is the angle behind my project, Toxic Temple, of like how can we actually grasp our, our desire to waste, our need to dispense energy in a more cultivated way which might enable survival for more beings on this planet. Um, I've talked a lot about um, like the Christian origins of capitalism so far and now I want to make a little step to um, Indian mythology, um, because I'm very interested in, in one of the main goddesses, uh, god, gods of, of Indian religion, which is Shiva, because as you all know, and you know better than I do, <laughs> that um, he is considered to be, among other titles, the god of destruction. And I find this very interesting, because um, from my cultural background, destruction is not something good, not something to be affirmed. But um, in, in Indian religion, you, you have Brahmin, you have Vishnu, and you have Shiva. Um, and, and they're all equally good, they're all equally necessary. Um, and Shiva is, is destruction. So I find this very interesting that in Indian religio re religiousness, as in many others, there's actually a role for, for destruction. And we could maybe refine that in Shiva cults or something. And that would be very interesting in your opinions because they are much more profound than mine, I'm sure. Um, So much about like the, the religious part of my project. Um, I'm now talking a little bit of where in our modern uh, cultures we have already developed slight hints or or ideas of, of combining religion with waste. And what comes up to mind first is nuclear waste because there is a research field called nuclear semiotics, um, which is a very interesting one. It emerged in the 70s and the 80s, and it is concerned. It was actually kicked off by a research question that the NASA, uh, the, 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 the American Space Agency, um, um, put into the International Journal for Semiotics because the problem is that, of course, the best practice we, we have with nuclear waste, because we have a lot of it, is that we dig it into the ground somewhere very deep where it's safe. And so there are two tasks with that, because we know that for millions of years it will be toxic waste. We need to keep it down there and untouched, because if it would touch our biological life, it would, it would corrupt it, it would mutate it, it would destroy it. So the first task is that we bury it deep enough, and the engineers have to, have to assure that for a million years the probability <coughs> is very high that it will be untouched. So this is the first task. But then there's a second problem. The second problem is that what if intelligent beings, be they human or non-human, um, want to enter this deliberately? Because against this, we cannot secure ourselves. So what do we do? Um, and then we need, of, of course, to put out warning signs. Um, shall I stop for a second? Yeah, maybe let me set it in. You can also come over here. There are more spaces here. For those who just arrived, <laughs> we uh, have, have just tried to talk a little bit about nuclear semiotics, which is basically the question, if we dig our nuclear waste into the deep ground, which is now our best practice, which we are doing, how can we communicate, <laughs> how can we communicate to future beings, be they intelligent or not, that they should not enter? So we have to put out warning signs in a way. But if it's in English or in Hindi or in German or in any other language, it's very likely that already in 1,000 years this will, will not be readable to the future beings. And we're talking of millions of years. So we cannot think of any sign system, even the warning sign system, of which we can be sure that they will understand it in the future. And so what do we do? And there have been many, many scientists all over the world since the 80s been concerned with this question. And the answers they came up are really hilarious and crazy at, at many times because many of them um, propose a religion. They, 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 they propose something they call the atomic priesthood. Mm -hmm. So they want to form a little sect which has this deeper knowledge into radioactivity and its lethal dam damaging potential, 
which which forms the sect and over millennia should like pass from one generation to the other this knowledge like the Vatican does right now for Christianity or something. So religion is is a key to communicate dangers over longer um, over longer passages of time. And uh, what you're seeing here are some um, um, models which some artists and scientists proposed of how this like nuclear waste that should look like that most beings would want to keep away from it. And this is like, one of the proposals, I'll show you some. Um, so the idea is that if, if there's no sign languages, what for most beings would like tell them to keep away? And these thorns, we have them in biology in many plants and so on, also in animals, uh, like the hedgehog. So this is like an idea, this is how we could maybe keep future beings away from nuclear waste. Um, and they're also all very spiritual and rich, religiously charged. Um, maybe the last idea uh, coming from nuclear se semiotics, which is really hilarious, is called the Ray Cat solution, which is actually being done right now. Um, the Ray Cat solution uh, has the idea of genetically modifying cats in a way that if they come close to nuclear waste, they should change their color, <laughs> like here. And um, since cats have in many cultures a very important function, even at the ancient Egyptians already, they, they like you know, Cleopatra, the, the, the queen of, of um, e Egypt, she had cats around her, they were always religious symbols. So cats will be venerated by many humans in the future, maybe. And so this is an illustration of the ray cat solution that the old people will pass on the knowledge of the cats. And if the cat turns her, her color into another color, this might be a sign of danger. So just to show you where art and science and science fiction come together in a really crazy, hilarious way, these are just examples, and I, I can very much encourage you to look more into nuclear semiotics because it's a beautiful field of how to think with the ecological problems in very creative ways. Um, yes, um, I'm um, with Anna Lerchbaumer in, in my Toxic Temple project um, extending this views of, of nuclear waste to plastic waste because Plastic waste um, will um, la not last as long as, as, as nuclear waste, which will last for millions of years, but we can be quite sure that there will be plastic on this planet when we won't be there anymore. So this, this is also a way we are communicating um, um, with the future, with the afterlife of humanity. And this I find very interesting, and this is um, what I've been occupied here at the Chitkara campus with in the last days. Um, that I've tried to find a poetry or a language which is not human or not, not only human in plastic waste because we can imagine that this also will look like that in let's say 1000 years and we won't be there, we might be extinct in 50 years <laughs> um, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find what could be a language for future beings which find that because of course we have many cultural codes on our plastic products, they are of text, many of them are, are sexist in a way, if they have like beautiful females or something on it. Um, so this is our, our, our meaning we put on them, but they have a meaning in themselves. And I'm interested in speculating about what do they communicate to future beings. Um, and this is also why I bought these little very, very trashy USB speakers uh, at the Daily Electric Bazaar, um, because in a humorous way, I'm trying to make them the messengers to the afterlife of humanity, to the transcendence of humanity, in like letting them speak the poems uh, of, of extinction of humanity and the afterlife of plastic and oil products um, on, on waste piles. I'm, I'm just showing you like some film stills. I'm, I'm cutting a little film. This is all uh, within 300 meters of the campus. It's of course outside because inside it's very clean and outside it's very dirty which might remind us of Bataille and other theories. Um, and um, I, I think there is a certain beauty in, in plastic waste, which we might, might want to cultivate in a way, in, in this toxic temple way of cultivating our wasting of, of the planet. Um, yeah, so much about this. Um, Speaking about beauty, um, maybe a last thing I would like to add is a sentence I recently read by Stanislaw Lem. He's a Polish science, science fiction writer. And um, <coughs> the sentence really struck me and, and I had to think about it a lot. He said that in the 19th century, 
and in the 19th century we, and this is a European we, are, we, um, we, we thought that beauty is always the good, so what is beautiful is good. <coughs> and he's saying after the, the, the atomic nuke, after the atomic bomb exploded, he said that's the most beautiful thing he ever saw. And so he's saying, now we're kind of getting to grips with that what is beautiful might be very evil, actually. So we have this twist of that beauty might not be the healthy thing, but it might also be the evil thing. And that's a very interesting turn, I think. And so I'm, I'm putting this as an open question into the room here. Like, what is this beauty? <laughs> and what does it do with us? Um, and I think with this question and the second prayer, I, I will leave you and I'm looking forward to, to questions and the discussion. Let us still drink from this chalice, effervescent trims of thin atomania. Under this human heaven, in poison appears, the new horizon, cactus with abstract visions, grapes of numbing noise, herbs for the giggling reeling, nothing grows on these soils, the ecstasy of someplace else, the beyond, the healthy equilibrium, siding with the discarded, the bizarre, indestructive God hear my prayers, in the here and now, more viral than previously assumed. Do you also want to be more? We are disintegrating molecular flesh, permeated of synthetics, heart beats plastic channel, echoing the abyss, the great hole, yearning of all, Shiva's smile defies, new alliances with yours, Fusions of free radicals. Rise cancer, you slow decay. Satellite of new orders, elation. Bursting of the nature. <laughs>